Hello there, this is Caitlin Greer. I'm in your English 234 class presenting my audiovisual project. I named my project I Want My Roots Back because I thought it represented the persona and the ideas that Pacific Islander writers um, had as they expressed their history and their past with influences in English writing and colonialism and their evolution from more oratory um, processes of presenting stories and timelines, but now are more focusing on returning back to those roots and going back to telling oratory stories and explaining their history and legends through art. Here I am introducing my critical reading. I use Teresia's Teoiwa's uh, What Remains to be Seen, Reclaiming the Visual Roots of Pacific Literature. And the first thing that caught my eye is when I was going through this critical reading, is through this critical text, was the direction that she went through right off the bat. She was very affirmative. She was very direct. Um, and this is expressed in the very first sentence, for example, when she says, Once were people without writing, and this text is all capitalized. So it's a big emphasis on what the world has said about Pacific Islanders' writing. And what we come to know is that they're okay with being those people. Next, we look at her quote, lack is deficiency, which is like a negative mentality that um, she expresses when she's referencing those people um, that are making these quote unquote criticisms that not having writing and not having a language that can be communicated and transformed through lots of different people, that without having that, that having a lack of language is a lack of an indeficiency. Next, we look at our third quote, the detractors see this ordinary lack as a permanent imp impediment to the development of worthy literature. And I italicized worthy because that's an opinion. And so what classic English writers may see as worthy literature is something that may be complex and can very have extensive language and hyperboles and all of these extreme thoughts and um, something that must be so complex and so elaborate. But as we know of New Zealand literature, that is not the case. That it is not so extreme. It is very straightforward. It is very theatrical. It is very honest. It is very real because most of the stories that they tell are real. They did happen. They're a part of their history. They may be here and there a little bit, but they're real and they're, they're honest. And finally, we look at our fourth quote, we are people who do not read. And this I thought was very interesting because obviously now in New Zealand people do read and in people in Pacific Islands do read, but that was not their traditional form of education or a way to learn more about the past or predictions about the future. In this slide, we look at what remains to be seen reclaiming the visual roots of Pacific literature's um, support from its texts. Um, and so most of the references and support found in this article comes from other Pacific Islanders' writings and uh, through their expressions of language and stories that are similar to those 
that we find in New Zealand, um, like tattooing or tatua and oral stories or pottery like we find in Fiji, Lapita, Fijian Lapita, um, and carvings that we can also find in, say, the meeting houses um, in New Zealand. On the right, we can actually see a pua pua um, of Tui and Rauru um, that can explain um, the legend of their story. Um, they were actually best known for being um, great ancestors of New Zealand and being founders of tribes um, all around, mostly the North Island, um, but all through New Zealand. Um, but a few examples of this can be from Julian Makaya's um, entry on the Solomon Islands. Um, she says that the Solomon Islanders are like regional neighbors. They have strong oral traditions, histories, rituals, genealogies, incantations, and customs that are handed down by word of mouth. We see a similar suggestion, um, but for Guam. From Keith Lejuan Camacho, he writes, The richest sources of Chamaro literature are to be found in oral traditions, ranging from legends and folk tales to a variety of musical forms. So here we can see that this idea of oral communication and imagery with our body language um, is very prized. But we can also see that in today's society. If we talk about, for example, musical forms, we can think about the stories that we see on Broadway in New York City in America. We can think about how people cherish those moments together and how those ideas can just bring stories to life and how you see those things. Similar to what I just mentioned about Broadway plays, we see that Tutusia's Avia's Wild Dogs Under My Skirt was actually made into an award-winning play, um, which I thought was very interesting um, in how they could take an oral story or a poem that is typically presented orally and can make that into um, a play and can add music behind it and can transform it um, to be a form of not only um, education and informing people uh, of a of a tradition and of a past, but can also inspire them through musical tradition. Um, so we see that she is talking about her Samoan culture, specifically her um, process of tattooing. Um, I think that this is an expression of her quote unquote roots in reference to um, the critical text. And so I think that expresses her identity and who she is and who she finds her self to be from and who she identifies as. And so in through her poem, I think that she expresses confidence in her community and that she is um, proud to be where she is from. She is inspired by her tradition and her genealogy or her whakapapa. Um, in her expression, as we especially saw in the video, uh, we saw her use of voice. Um, she you know, goes up and down in her voice to avoid expression and add voice and emphasis on different parts. And so um, through this, we also see her facial expression so we can see how she's feeling. We can see her, um, her passion and her, her frustration and her desires of what she really wants to happen. And um, so you can see her, her, her going back and forth and her thoughts about um, comparisons between the world and then her community and her as a person and an individual with an identity. Um, and through this, she can also demonstrate her, her thoughts through her movements of her hands and her body language, which I thought was very key. I wanted to reference a few specific lines in the poem, Wild Dogs Under My Skirt. Firstly being, I want to sit opposite the Tufoga and know he means me pain. This references her actually receiving the tattoo 
and what the process is going to look like. And from my research, it does not look quite fun. Um, it looks highly painful, um, as she says. Um, this can represent um, the struggle of what it can be like in her culture. Um, today, I would believe that this tattooing is probably optional, but I believe that it does actually claim you to your culture and it represents a, a proudness and a, a sense of community and a sense of identity that this is who I am, this is where I come from. Um, it may not be fun, but it is who I am, so this is what I'm going to do. Secondly, I look at the quote, like paddling across the whole Pacific in a log. This represents the genealogy and the community that come um, from this tribe of the Samoa people. And so I would like those of New Zealand, uh, Maori background did come from um, a different place. So they were um, travelers and explorers that explored the different Pacific islands and many would find an island and establish a place and establish a society really. Um, but then many would move along to start and uh, find a new home and begin a new culture and a new society. Um, we know that from our Maori education in New Zealand talking about um, each individual has a waka. And thirdly, I want to frighten my lovers, let them sit across from me and whistle through their teeth. I thought this had a lot of drama to it. Um, I thought it was very um, descriptive and I thought it was very dramatic. Um, and I was a little frightened, to be honest. Um, I believe that this expresses the strength um, that the tattoo can represent and the strength and confidence one can have in who they are, in their identity, and their um, passion for their background. Um, and even though people may not accept it, especially of um, this modern day world and not often accepting differences of people and differences of background, um, People are, seem to be highly prejudiced these days. Um, but I thought that was a very extreme quote, and she has other references like that as well. Um, like she references um, animals like a centipede. Very uh, unique and different to be so aggressive, I would think, in um, a lot of modern writing. I set up this slide to be a visual representation, but also um, a qualitative representation. Um, as we can see, when we're looking at the differences in putting writing on paper, putting um, Pacific Islander writing on paper, and putting the stories on paper, we can see that there's very few pros and more cons. Um, so that is a good representation of the attitude um, that our authors have of we don't need the acceptance um, of the world. We can do our own thing. We can have our own culture. And so looking at these pros, um, firstly, we can look at communication with the world. Communication in the world is a greater form of communication than a promise and a far better alternative, for example, of war, as Robert Nicole refers to as he talks about the Cook's Islands interactive history with the French Polynesians um, in the first critical article we looked at. Um, secondly, we can look at published writings. And so with language, we can put published writings out there, which could potentially cause um, or result in industry or anything like that and fame to um, Pacific Islander writings and authors. Um, documentation of actions and history for all people to read. So this would allow for um, stories and representations of history and people. 
to be read all around the world and would made them make them readily available either today, like on the internet, um, or through books um, that can be sent all throughout the world today. Um, so also in books, we can also have the potential for pictures. And so a big downfall um, of not being in person, hearing something or seeing somebody tell you a story is that there is no visual. Um, but now we do have the potential for pictures, but not often is that utilized. So looking at the cons, we have the loss of oral storytelling um, practices. So if there's, if you're reading a book, obviously nobody is going to be telling you a story from their mouth unless somebody's reading aloud, but that doesn't really count. So next, we'll look at the loss of imagery. And so especially in looking at the distinctive languages of Pacific Island countries, um, we lose imagery. So we lose the descriptive words. So even though we can translate words from native languages to English, there are always still some things that are more of an idea rather than a translation or one word. It's more of an idea that comes with connotations. So we lose all of those things through um, lack of details that are lost, and then we, we lose the, the dramaticism that we could see in Avia's presentation of... Um, wild dogs under my skirt we lose her using her arms and being big and imaginative and through all of this we just lose a sense of culture um, we lose so many details so many hands-on actions um, that cannot be translated on a piece of paper um, and unfortunately not all pacific islanders can or could write um, so they could not express their stories and express their history. Um, over time, we have seen as people have um, asked later generations to focus more on writing, that they have lost this ability to learn stories very quickly and a loss of memorization, and they cannot communicate with people as well as they uh, once have desired to have desired and been able to. And that is such a shame because what a skill to have. Um, and finally, we have the assimilation of the world's requirements of a worthy society. Um, worthy, again, as we uh, referenced in the critical paper. Um, and why would you want to assimilate to a world so large um, with such big ideas when you are so unique? Um, and who defines worthy is the big question. Why does the English language or um, colonials define what is worthy, what is good, what is right? Um, it is also just different. When discussing the different worldviews, we can first look at genre. And so most published sources of Pacific Islands um, is an attempt to write down oral stories or histories or genealogies or anything um, that they can find uh, desirable or important to share. Um, we look at ocean, oceanic imagery, which is referenced um, which in the first critical writing, What Remains to be Seen, Reclaiming the Visual Roots of Pacific Literature. Um, so this was kind of a defined title or genre that was given to oceanic, um, Pacific Oceanic writings um, because it is not specifically fiction or not technically considered nonfiction as well. So they kind of defined it as their own genre. Um, even though oceanic imagery is still difficult to define um, because there are so many cultures that are wrapped into that title of Pacific Oceana. Um, these classic English genres are the uh, foundation to most writings of the world. A few styles include um, the novel, short fiction, and written poetry, um, which we can now see through 
um, Avia's Wild Dogs Under My Skirt poem, which is written and now published um, for the whole world to see. Many of the Maori stories and legends were once told orally or expressed in other art forms like carvings, pottery, or playlight demonstrations, as we've talked about previously, um, and are now made into such things as musicals. Um, but they are also written down. However, if one is ever doing highly specific research, one will probably struggle to find an abundance of specific information about one specific subject. Trust me, I have the experience. Through my short semester at Victoria University, I have noticed that there are often more videos with voiceovers and illustrations than plain documents to, expect, to express an aspect of the culture. For example, in my other Maori class, um, we watched multiple videos on the legends of Maui and the creation story, um, referencing the Sky Father and the Earth Mother and their children, um, which I found to be very interesting, um, but not surprising. So looking at an additional worldview, we can look at language. And specifically, I focused on colloquialism um, and the use of language that we talked about earlier um, in the first critical writing um, about how the author was so direct and straightforward. Um, there was little that was distracting or um, complicated or hard to understand. Um, so, for example, we can reference, once were people without writing. Lack is deficiency. She talks as if we're talking about fact, not opinion. Um, but in, it, as we will soon find out, we are talking about opinion and um, perception. Um, in the first uh, few paragraphs, we can see that she has um, extreme sarcasm, which is extremely casual, um, or colloquial, um, in the quote, few ever say they lacked a written script and they haven't produced any literature of note. It must be because they have a superior civilization. And I took notice in that these are actually in parentheses. So it's as if she said it under her breath in sarcasm, which I thought was very interesting. And very different, not seen very often. Um, in Wild Dogs Under the Skirt, um, we can see the use of simple English words, um, which probably come from a simple translation um, that it was probably written in um, the traditional Samoan native language. Um, but we can see the use of these basic words that are very complex and straightforward as well. Um, she uses relatable references, and what's interesting is that she uses a mix of language, including the native words like tafuga, um, referencing her tattoo artist. Um, that is a title, but we can also see this in different literary works where we see combinations of words. Um, this can also reference going back to when we have a lack of words that can um, fully describe a situation or an experience. Um, through translation. So oftentimes they may not use um, an English translation, but will use a traditional um, native word that can fully express the idea and can fully express the details. Here we look at our final world of view, looking at the presentations of writings. These two worlds may be different, but they are one world in the age of technology that we live in now. But as Teresea Teiwa concludes in her article, once were people without writing, still a people without great literature. That remains to be seen. Little seems to have changed. Writings are published around the world and across the internet, but when was the last time you were recommended a Pacific literature text for your nice beach read? Even though this could be an unfortunate thought, Teiwa suggests that Pacific Islanders don't need the fame. They are content because they can keep their culture, their culture, this, the culture that they define themselves. 
the one that comes with their genealogy, the one that comes with their history, the one that comes with their customs, the ones that come with tradition and where they are, their identity, who they are, where they come from. Um, we can also look at um, the oratory practices and traditional customs are now more valued um, because of their history with colonization um, of greater superpowers in the world um, that took away their identity to be um, unique and to um, move forward. And so they look back at um, what once was, their traditions, their customs, and they now find more value in them. And it's allowing them to keep their culture alive. Um, it allows people to reflect back to their history, what their people have been through in all of their lifetimes. Um, so again, another example of these oratory practices and um, different ways of expression is the art that tells uh, stories, like the Fijian Lapita pottery that is... Um, presented in the picture, and these are all seen as uh, different values um, that are symbols of a history, and that can inspire details that um, may have been lost over time otherwise. I wanted to say thank you for your time, and I hope you have a great day. And let me know if you have any questions. I have referenced each picture below, and I have used the two articles provided for me. Thanks.